It's time for fun, learning, commentary, laughs, and more care of the most diverse group in the genealogy and family history world. Welcome to Black Pro Gen Live with your hosts, Nika and True, and the baddest panel in these pedigree streets. Angela, James, Linda, Alex, Ellen, Tony, Shelly, Teresa, Bernice, Felicia, Willie, Renata, and Tasia. It's Black Pro Gen Live, genealogy, family history research with flavor. Hello and good evening, everyone. We just want to welcome you to Black Pro Gen Live. Um, it's Tuesday night, and we just want to thank you from for showing up from wherever you're coming in at, whether you're new or old. And my name is True Lewis, and I'm going to be your co-host for the evening. And we have a packed episode tonight about these documents that we're going to dig deep into. So now I'm going to turn it over to your host and our girl, Nika Smith. Hello, True. How are you? Hi. <laughs> it's been a minute. <laughs> it has been a minute. It has been a minute, but we thank you as she mentioned. We thank you so much for joining us on this Tuesday night. We know that This Is Us is on. We know that you know that Jack is dead. We know that you know that Randall has gone crazy. Maybe not. We're trying to figure out what's going on with Deja. We're not really sure. They keep foreshadowing to the, they actually keep flashing forward to the, to the present. And we don't know if she's in jail or if somebody else is in jail or we just don't know what's going on. This is us. But you're not here for This Is Us. You are here for another form of genealogy in the form of a genealogical show called Black Pro Gen Live. Thanks yes. so much for joining us. And don't forget to set your DVRs for This Is Us. So then when we end, you can watch This Is Us later. Tonight's topic, have you ever found a document, added the details to your database or online tree, and then never looked at it again? Get more return on your research investment by learning how to break down and analyze all the info on the documents you gather and where to proceed in your research afterward. Thanks for joining us for Biology of a Document, From Analysis to Plan. Have a question or comment? Join the conversation now. Participate in the live chat on YouTube to the top right hand of the screen if you're watching on a computer and at the bottom of the YouTube app on your mobile device. Also, weigh in on Twitter by tweeting us at BlackProGen or use the hashtag BlackProGen. Here is your reminder to set reminders. All you need to do is head over to my YouTube channel and head to the upcoming live streams area and set a reminder for the shows that are already loaded there going all the way until our 2018 season ends. And you can also get reminders by subscribing to Who is Nika Smith on YouTube as well. If you're tired of seeing Confederate flag ships, flowers, and the wrong oil paintings as profile pictures for your ancestors, so are we, and we're here to save the day. Download our new icons for online family tree profiles today. We're adding new ones all the time, so if we miss something, be sure to let us know. In fact, I just added and created a new one called Research in Progress. If you notice there, it, it's right there at the top right-hand corner of the screen, and this is for those lines that you're trying to figure out how they're connected to you genetically, and they're just kind of in your tree but not attached to anybody. That would be a great way to add a new tree icon for those people. Also, surprise, the panel does not know this. This is the first time they're seeing this slide. Do you love or hate the topics we discussed this year? Well, here is your chance as a viewer to provide feedback on potential topics for 2019. Yes, we are opening the door. I don't know if this is a good thing or not. <laughs> for the viewers to tell us what they think we should cover next year. Participate in our viewer survey today. True will be putting the link out um, in the live chat for people to click on that. We have a million and one potential topics. Yes, you have to go through all of them and tell us whether or not you love it or you hate it. And don't forget, there are already 70, nearly 70 episodes of the show that have already aired on a number of topics. So be sure to click the uh, or check the all seasons playlist before you give your suggestions because 
because if you say, oh, you guys should do a show on the Freedmen's Bureau, clearly you didn't watch this year. Or maybe you should do a show on North and South Carolina. Oh, clearly you didn't watch last year. Or maybe you guys should cover Finding Your Roots. Nope, we did that in 2015 and we did it in 2016. So be sure to check that out as well. You might have some things that maybe we just have forgotten about, or maybe we need to talk about more in depth. So don't forget, weigh in on your, uh, and give your feedback for 2019 topics. That doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna take your topics. We'll take it into consideration, but we're gonna flow with what works best for us. All right, we've got a packed house tonight. They're coming in from all over. We're purple and blue and red and orange and black and a little blue and a little brown. Come off mute panelists and say hello. I, clearly I didn't wear my family reunion t-shirt because it seems like a lot of people are wearing those today. Am I wrong? Um, I got my ancestors on. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa's got her statement to you. Question bridge, black males. <laughs> okay. 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 You all see what this is? That says uh, something. Cote d'Ivoire. She's got on her oh, Cote d'Ivoire. Wow. And then look at this. Ellen got this. We're a writer. It was an art project. <laughs> but it had calaveras all over it. It had a, um, I had a, I had a piece in the radio. They had a radio that played poetry and different pieces inside. It was at the Oakland uh, Museum a few years ago. Okay, that's a cool t-shirt. I, I, I'm wearing a a duster with cockatiels on it. I guess <laughs> I, 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 I said this was my memorial shirt to my two birds named Bud and Rudy, if you call it, <laughs> pun there, uh, that my mother proceeded to clean out the bird cage with pine saw. And the next morning, they were no longer with us. So rest in peace, Bud and Rudy the birds. <laughs> My memorial duster. I'm kidding. All <laughs> right, let's get started. Uh, True, since you went uh, first um, in your ancestor shirt, checking in from Fort Knox, Kentucky. Yay! That's cool. <laughs> I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. And look oh, at the yeah. black lady. Isn't she pretty? Where? Raise, raise it you up. Gotta ra well, yeah. Don't show us your tummy now. <laughs> <laughs> I was it, I can't tell if I'm showing it or not from my yeah. camera, but we saw. It. Yeah, I ordered this one offline. I'm waiting to get uh, Nika's cousin next, <laughs> but I'm here at Fort Knox, Kentucky, um, checking in, and I'm just glad to be here and seeing everybody out there in the chat room. All right, True. True's getting her Tupac on tonight with her little yes. <laughs> Gangsta party over here. Gangsta party. <laughs> she went. She went full gusto. It's a little. Well, you know, it's sort of apropos because the anniversary of his death was last month. So that would be sort of together. All right. Uh, our lady in purple down there in Florida, Tony. Hi, Jen friends. I'm Tony Carrier from the Center for Family History at the International African American Museum in Charleston, and I'm in Charleston tonight. Oh. oh. Wow. Yes. I yeah. added you in my prayer because of Michael coming to visit. He's going <laughs> to visit us tomorrow. <laughs> well, all I have to say is that your backgrounds are very consistent because I they can never tell good. if you're in Florida or if you're in <laughs> Charleston. So that's a good thing. All right. Our next lady in purple all the way up there in New York, Teresa. Teresa Vega, uptown near the boogie down. Uptown. I'm here and uh, it's been a nice uh, couple of days and I was happy, I want to say a day late, but uh, happy Indigenous People's Day. So I thought I'd say that. The only Christopher we celebrate is Wallace. All right, moving forward, <laughs> as in Biggie Smalls. Uh, next person in purple is James. Good evening, everybody. James Morgan coming to you. Uh, from outside DC. I am nowhere near as energetic as I probably normally am on here. And that's because I just got off a plane less than 24 hours ago from Alabama. Uh, I had an impromptu uh, research trip. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my family, we had to funeralize uh, uh, my dear aunt uh, and uh, lost another relative in the course of doing that. So I am extremely tired, my eyes are dry, mm -hmm. but the show must go on and I'm happy to be back <laughs> on Black Pro Gen because even though, you know, I had to bury my aunt and everything, you know, we're always talking about dead people on here as well. So, you know, it kind of, it kind of works out in the end. Uh, always remember to save obituaries. 
Mm -hmm. We have a whole show on death coming up. Yes. <laughs> right. I almost feel like, should we, oh, should we, you know what? Why don't, <laughs> panel, we're going to dress like we're going to a funeral on that episode. I want Ooh. hats. I want all the dramatics. You know, maybe I'll make myself a little birdcage swoop of a hat, maybe. Pull out granddad's fan. Can, That's can what I, I'm saying. We got the fan church fan, the Mahalia Jackson fan. Can, can I no, be that? But... Can I be that cousin that falls out in front of the casket? <laughs> <and Jackson>, uh... <laughs> no, she that oh. that was my grandmother, and I have plenty of experience with that. Uh, Lord, today, matter of fact, speaking of churches, I saw this this video. This lady, the older lady, was leading the choir, and her skirt fell down in front of the congregation. Mm. Now, thank you, she had on a slip, but a lot of people don't wear those. Mm. So when we're dressing up for our uh, funeral episode or our death episode, make sure you. Put your slip on, ladies. Right. Oh, look, look, if I could say one one last thing, oh, I'm, sure. so happy I, I'm so happy I kept my genealogy hat on, even though I was obviously upset um, because we were cleaning out the house and everything. I came across my grandmother's high school diploma. Ooh, nice. Yeah. That would be a great thing for this episode had you scanned it and sent it to me earlier. Well, I, <laughs> I found it after the deadline. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Moving on to our one of our favorite aunties. Over there in Maryland with her coat of wash shirt on. <laughs> Hello. The, the health of Bernice Alexander Bennett. <laughs> Hi, everybody. As you said, straight out of Cote d'Ivoire. All right. Glad to be back home, but I sure love the motherland. Mm. She still got her glow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was about to say her skin is all sun kissed. <laughs> hey, I mean it too. I mean it. That's funny. <laughs> That's because when she got off the plane, they sprayed her with vibranium. You didn't know that? <laughs> they make spray bottles. They go like this. Yes, yes, purple 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 you get vibranium. <laughs> We're going to send love from Wakanda. We sure are. All right. All right. That she Auntie Shelly, go ahead with your brown and your tree. Say my hey. Brown and my tree. Hey, I'm in mean gray. Oh, it looks a little. Okay. Maybe it's it is solid gray, just like this hair. <laughs> <laughs> Holly Gray, Shelly Murphy coming from Virginia, Central Virginia area, aka Family Tree Girl. Glad to be here. Y'all uh -huh. can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Finally, yes. we worked that out. Thank you, Jesus. On high, church <laughs> hat. Yes. Yeah. Do you want me to grab a hat? Oh my lord! No, that's what I'm saying. If chat room, if you guys think we really should get, get dressed up in funeral attire for the life after death episode, please be sure to chime I don't in go to on funerals. Twitter. Okay, but I'm just saying you you might have a big hat. You might want to be. A, you I've might want to read the it. See, that's C. Three hats. C. Oh my goodness! All right, Renata. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everybody. This is Renata Yarbrough Sanders, known around the internet also as Nada Sue for my blog, uh, Into the Light. I'm just a little under the weather tonight, but really, really happy to be here with you guys. And I am not a big t-shirt wearing person, but tonight I guess I should at least show you. Um, this is says, uh, how can a question change the world? And this is from the Question Bridge Black Males Project that I posted a while back, my daughter works on, and it is an awesome project. If you are a black male, go to crush, Question Bridge, I hope it's questionbridge.com and get involved and let your voice be heard. Glad to be here tonight. You know what? We need to ask people if they want us to wear T-shirts on this show, because we mm -hmm. sure do do a, give a lot of promo for T-shirts, don't we? Oh, yeah. I, oh yeah. yeah, first time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean typically we do. The whole panel will usually have something on, but last but not least, Yay. our glasses wearing Boricua sister. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes, with her low riders. Yes, if you don't know the song. <laughs> She's got a low rider shirt. I knew it was a low rider. When she stood up, I was like, oh, she's got a low rider. If you look really close, it's got Calaveras all over it. It was an amazing, oh. amazing car, you know? <laughs> it's like, it was it was something else. No. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got a lot to get to tonight. And we want to make sure that you get every single bit of it. This episode is focused primarily on the fact that we extract information from documents all the time. And a lot of time we miss the obvious. 
right? Or actually we get the obvious, but we miss the, the, the small nuggets and things that are actually crucial towards moving you forward in your research. We usually want to get those big ticket items like death dates, death locations, you know, since we've been talking about death, uh, birth dates, birth locations, marriages, marriage locations, the names of children, all those sorts of things. But there's more to genealogy than just the facts. It's a lot more than just the facts, right? There's color, there's texture, there's all sorts of things in there. And you don't get that full picture if you're just primarily focusing on those big ticket items. You know, I mean, think about it this way. We all love a good sale, but sometimes you gotta go digging a little bit to get to that really good find, right? And some of us don't like digging. We will never step foot in a TJ Maxx or a Ross because we just wanna be able to go to the store and just go right there and get it. But there is something to be said about the sale rack. And in some ways, I feel like we may be missing some good discount or some good gains in our genealogy research by only looking at the obvious parts of genealogy. All right. so. First up, and we're going to go through a series of documents. You guys are going to be like, gosh, they got all this stuff together quickly. Yes, we did, because we're a great team. But, but first up, I'm going to start with Shelly Murphy, because we're going to go through the biology of document. Basically, this entire episode is, an, is a, a panel execution of, of Shelly Murphy's so what concept. Shelly's, Sh Shelly, give a brief description of so what, so people understand what exactly what we're doing. Well, it kind of ties into Renata's shirt, actually. It's about asking questions and analyzing a document. So when you get a document, the, the option or, or the criteria should be that you start questioning the information that's on there. And of course, as you question, you're building your timeline. Had to say timeline. So now I won't say anything else about it because Nika <laughs> come back with it. But anyway, you question the information that's on there and you basically are saying, well, so what? I got this information. What's it good for? What's it telling me? Or what's next now that I've got a piece of information? So the logic is to go through each cell on a document, like a death certificate or, or any document. It could be a deed, a will, and just question the information. And, and what can it take you to another level? Or does it cause conflict? And then again, you have to resolve the conflict. So that's basically the so what. You're having a little private conversation with a document. Mm, and as I say, going on a honeymoon. Uh, yep. Stop it on the way in Vegas. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Got married. But some yeah. documents can yes. give it to you. Yes. You it's, and some. That's what I'm saying. Some documents. You'll go on a honeymoon. You'll be on yeah. for a long time. It'll be completely paid for. Others, you're gonna leave it at the hotel and go and get an annulment. <laughs> yes. Or I'm gonna hit the slide. <laughs> I'm gonna hit the slide. <laughs> yes. Yes. And those documents, some can give it. But another thing about these, the so what, if the information is missing, which you know, we get a lot of documents that have missing information, then you have to ask who would have that information or where would it be at or who's the likely person or entity that would also have it. So you can start building a research plan of where you're going next to try to resolve the issue. There's the Great setup, Shelly Murphy. Good okay. job. Good All right, job. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so the documents that we selected yeah. are, for the most part, I would say 90% of them are outside of the purview that, that the average person is thinking about. What I'm talking about is this is not the census. We're not going to be looking at the census because we gather in your research efforts, you should be at a place where you should be able to distill all the information on a census form. This is the further, this is the intermediate to advanced level of research that we want our viewers to be able to get to. So the first document that I have is, uh, Shelly, this is yours. And tell us a little bit uh, about this document. Well, what you have there is called, and it's from the state of Virginia, and it happens to be Loudoun County, Virginia, is a Certificate of Freedom. And the state of Virginia, they actually implemented this. Was that you calling me, Nika? No? No, ma'am. Oh, okay. Uh, in 1795, 
is when the document is dated, but the law went in place in 1793, actually chapter 22, basically saying that free Negroes or mulattoes shall register and be numbered in a book to be kept by the town clerk, tip, which shall specify age, name, color, their status, by whom, and what court if they were emancipated. And so what you're going to see or what's up on the screen now is Luke Goins Certificate of Freedom, which actually was issued in 1795 in Virginia. And you want me to keep going? Yeah, keep going. Okay, I'm going to keep going. So I've told you when the document was created. Now, why did I find that document or what came up? I knew there was a book called The Black Laws of Virginia. And in there, when I got to the 1700s, because it started back in the 1600s, on all the laws kind of in order. And I had listened to Judy Russell teaching at Maggie, and it was the slave laws. And she was walking people to a timeline. So when I came back home a few years ago, I went looking for this document and found the book. And I believe it was Judy Purcell, uh, Judy Purcell's Guild book, and it's called The Black Laws of Virginia, Chapter 5, Free Persons of Color and Slaves. And so I've already described it. So what I did with this document, it's you can see it was only about a paragraph. And at first, I wanted to understand the law. Who had to do it? Did it cost money? When did it have to be done? So I found all that information out, breaking it down, and then I start doing the so what. Basically, I knew what information was supposed to be on there. And so I went through basically line by line with my so what. So what I came out with that, okay, Luke Goins is the ancestor. He's got a wife named Margaret. Then I start questioning, okay, is there children? Keep going, keep going. There had to be witnesses for this document. So the witnesses basically are saying, I've known Luke Goins and this family, two witnesses, for 30 years, for the past 30 years, basically. So right there tells me, wait a minute, this document was signed in 1795. That just put me back to 1765. Basically, they're saying, this is when your ancestor or how long they'd known them in the area. Another clue in the area. So they've been in the same area for 30 years or in that neighborhood. And, and then there's different terms in there, like above the last frost. I don't know what that means. I'm assuming it's winter, you know, based on when the document was done in December. So then the witnesses talked about one of the sons being an apprentice. Okay, now I got another name. So I basically went through and found that Luke had a brother named Jason Goins. He also had a son named Jason Goins. And the son was an apprentice at one of those uh, neighbors' houses. So I gathered names, information, and also the requirement was that they would have to every three years get another one and pay a quarter. So I don't know if I have any more time, but it talked through there that they were in Loudoun County for the past 30 years, that frost. So I got a wealth of information out of it. All right. All right. So research wise, um, yes. How can our viewers use what you learned in their own research for research efforts for, to move them forward? What you got from this particular document? Well, now it's to go look for the other people that are listed, the brother, the son. Also research those neighbors. They've been in that neighborhood. I want to know if there's any other connections there. And all I know is that Luke Goins was a farmer, but this child, the brother, I'm sorry, the son was going to be an apprentice. An apprentice doing what? So I have to find that out. So it gave me more places to look in the same area, but I'm also building a neighborhood. There's a couple witnesses there that are in the neighborhood. Luke and his family is in the neighborhood. So who else is in that neighborhood that might be related to me? So that's basically 
expanding my research in that community locally to find information. Community research that Angela talks about quite a bit. Mm-hmm. All right, moving forward, next document is Tony Carrier. Yes, indeed. This is a bill of sale that was made in 1842 in which Daniel Hayward, acting as the executor of the estate of John Hayward, sold a number of enslaved people to John Raven Matthews, John R. Matthews. And there are sort of three really important bits of information on here. And I'm working on a blog post right now about analyzing this document. So I'm gonna zip right through the the things that we can do going forward from this document. And then you can look for that blog post tomorrow. But the first bit of important information is I, Daniel Hayward, executor of the estate of John Hayward, deceased. And that gives us right away a clue that there are other documents to be found. One of the first things to do is check for other bills of sale issued by Daniel Hayward in relation to this estate because if you know that your ancestor was in the enslaved community in that family slaveholding family you may not see them on this bill of sale but they may be on another bill of sale it's also not unusual to see the executor's name without the notation that he's the executor of the estate so check for bills of sale just executed by daniel hayward at that time to see if those are related to actually the estate of John Hayward. If you're looking at microfilm images to do it, like if you're looking on family search, look through the previous 10, 12, 14 pages, look through the next 10, 12, 14 pages, because he may have gone down all at once to have all these bills of sale recorded at the same time. All right, so he's the executor of the estate so we know that there's an estate so we're going to search for probate records and we're not only going to look for the deceased john hayward but look for the executor daniel hayward because he will be who is going to be making other records with the probate court such as probate accounts etc that were required every year another thing for south carolina because that's where this record was made and particularly for charleston is check the records of the equity court because Mm -hmm. sometimes you will see in there that there was an equity suit and a judgment but also in south carolina full on 30 percent of bills of sale that were made as a result of estate settlements were actually recorded in the equity court and not in the bills of sale. You'll find a bill of sale in there, but it's not recorded in the bills of sale. So always check the equity court. The next thing would be to check the Hayward family tree to learn the relationship of Daniel Hayward to John Hayward. The reason I say that, he may have inherited or purchased others from the estate, other enslaved people. You can check the Digital Library on American Slavery because that, although it's produced in North Carolina, gleaned an awful lot of equity petitions from South Carolina for that database. And then finally, I would say for that first piece of information, check the SCDAH online index to see if you find any other will, estate inventory, bill of sale, et cetera, for that executor. Now, going to the second important bit of information is the estate of John Hayward deceased. Right away, we know there's going to be estate papers. So you are going to search for the estate inventory and other probate records. If you find the estate inventory, look to see if family relationships are noted for those individuals who are listed in this bill of sale with no family relationships. Next, check historic newspapers to see if this was an advertised estate sale. Fourth, check archive grid to see if the the Hayward family papers are presented in archives, preserved in archives, and they are. There are two major collections of Hayward family papers. Also, another avenue is look for the documents before. See if you can learn how John Hayward acquired these enslaved people because that may take you back in generations. Finally, The third bit of information is John R. Matthews is the buyer. 
So we would want to research John R. Matthews to see if he died before or after emancipation. This was made in 1842. As it turns out, he okay. died in 1867, but the estate inventory listed the names of those who were freed in 1865 and family relationships, sure enough, are listed for those individuals who are listed in this bill of sale. His will lists two sons who inherited plantations from him. So we're going to look at Freedman's Bureau records and search for Freedman's labor contracts with those sons who inherited his plantation because they would be the ones entering into the labor contracts. Also use the family groupings from the estate inventory to search for census records, Freedman's Bureau records, et cetera, listed for these families. And finally, if you find census records, check the 1890 census veteran schedules to see if any of the adult men served in the USCT because in South Carolina, more than 5,000 men served in the USCT alone. High five, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Watch the blog uh, post tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And she had all her points. Well, I don't blame her because she had to do all this, you know, it doesn't make <laughs> the rest of the panelists, the blog post, what we're talking about is a great thing. Yeah. All right. Moving on to our next document. She gave you all the steps. Well, basically the format of what we're doing this is we want you to know what the document is, why it was created, which everyone is the last two people have said that, um, why they sought after this particular document, where you can find it, which in this instance, Tony, you found this online through Family Search, right? I found it on Fold3. Fold3 okay, she found it on Fold3.com. And mm -hmm. Shelly, you found yours at? Courthouse. At the courthouse. At the, the county actual courthouse. document. The actual document at the courthouse. Okay, and then um, after that, the key facts, they've gone through those. Where uh, were you able to, re where you're able to research, um, proceed research-wise as a result of analyzing the key facts, which they both went through that. And then lastly, how our viewers can use what they learned from your experience or from your presentation to move their research forward. And the, there's a lot of people doing cartwheels and whatnot in the chat room based off of what's been shared. <laughs> so clearly people are getting something from this. All right, so we're gonna move on to the next document, which is Renata's. All right. She's muted. You're muted, Renata. Oh, 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 okay. I thought you were doing it. Sorry. Okay. So what I was saying is we're going to have to have a little chat about me following Tony when we do these things, but uh, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Okay. So what I have um, to share tonight is um, something that I call small, but mighty. Uh, it is, I don't see it on the screen though. It is a tiny little be, death announcement. Toggling back and forth between you talking and the oh, document, okay. FYI. Right. Gotcha. Okay, so it is a tiny little death announcement um, from the Journal and Guide, the Norfolk Journal and Guide from June 1st, 1929. And I accessed this document through my um, membership at Library of Virginia, which you can access from your home or anywhere that you are with the remote um, uh, access. Um, however, it's also available through several other libraries, anybody that gets you into ProQuest historical newspapers. And what this is, is it is a death announcement about my great grandmother, my uh, mother's father's mother, who before finding this um, item, I knew only her first name and absolutely nothing else about her. Uh, I found it because I was searching the journal and guide for anything about Daniel Hill, which was my grandfather, Daniel Webster Hill. And so that brought her name up. So um, what I, a lot, I got a lot of key facts out of this tiny little article, um, the things that are underlined and more. First of all, I got her name. I got a surname for her. And I, that also gave me a heads up that she must have married after she um, was, uh, you know, after her Hill, Daniel Hill's father, who was Charles W. Hill. So I got a new surname for her. I found out where she lived, which was Gilmerton, Virginia. And if you're here in the Hampton Roads area, you may know that Gilmerton is a section of Chesapeake, the city of Chesapeake. But at the time, 
that this was posted, Gilmerton was actually um, in the county called Norfolk County. So that gave me some really good information because Gilmerton is still where it used to be. Um, I found out when she died and where she died. Uh, she died while she was visiting her daughter in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on May 19, 1929. Excellent information that I, and again, I had none of this because I didn't have that last name. So there was no way for me to find her. I had been looking for a pinky hill. Um, I found out that she was brought back to Gilmerton uh, for her funeral and interment. And this let me know that this truly was her home that, you know, if she was brought back here, this was her home. home. And of course the key was seeing that she is named as the mother of Mr. Daniel Hill of mm. Norfolk. And I knew that at that time, my grandfather and grandmother who had been married in 1926 were living in Norfolk. I knew exactly where they lived. Um, I didn't jump for joy when I first saw this because it had to be researched. There are at least four Daniel Hills in Norfolk at that time. So I had to do some additional research to tie Daniel Hill to Pinky Howell, which I was able to find him in her home in 1910, which I'd always had. I, I just wasn't sure it was right, but it had the middle initial W. And um, just, uh, well, I can't go off on that, but I found two or three other <laughs> ways of connecting to make sure that it was the right one. And then the last piece of new information was the fact that she had a daughter and her daughter's name was Martha. And her name was, I'm sorry, that's another one. Her, her daughter's name was Emma, uh, Emma Hayes, who she must have been visiting in Philadelphia. And so that sent me on another research path because I never knew anything about this daughter named Emma, who would be my great aunt. And I did find Emma with her husband, McCabe or Maccabee, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, Hayes in Philadelphia. Unfortunately, I haven't found any descendants for them, so I'm not sure what happens to them um, along the way, and I'm still researching it. And I just wanted to say um, that um, one other tidbit that I got from this, if I have enough time, one minute, oh, I don't know when that got put up there. Um, <laughs> I um, also got something really special from this. If you notice that her, my great grandmother's last name is Howell, and she was married to John B. Howell. And what I noticed from this is my grandfather, Daniel, named my uncle, his first son, Howell. And so that was another thing that really kind of connected for me and gave me like an aha moment. Um, when I found out when Pinky and John married, I learned that this man had basically raised my grandfather from a young age and um, he lived in the home with them even as a young adult in uh, Gilmerton for at least one census period. And so I felt like, okay, he must have had respect for this man, maybe felt like he was a father figure to him. And he named his son Howell and gave my uncle Howell his own middle name Webster. So his name is Howell Webster Hill. And that just kind of, you know, gave me some information. So the takeaway here is not to overlook newspaper research and definitely not to overlook teeny tiny little articles that may not look powerful because this one was very powerful for me. And just to, um, in addition to the bigger papers, make sure you're looking at community papers, um, make sure you're looking definitely at our black newspapers, um, and even the colored sections of other newspapers. Thank you. All right, moving forward, Ellen. Hi, so this is um, an 1847 document and it's for a ward in, in Moca, which is a municipality in Puerto Rico. And what I, um, I took these photographs back like in 2007 when I visited the archives and um, every so often, and I haven't looked at them in a long time, but I needed to figure out something about who was living in the area. So what this document is in 1847, it's part of a set of, of municipal document series. And they, this is like another way to grid people uh, in, uh, in a population. 
So we have um, uh, censuses of who, who arrived and who left and uh, the ownership of the property. So on this one, what I was um, highlighting on the left are the columns. So um, you can use this to cross-reference with a number of other documents going by the people who are living there. Uh, on the left-hand side, it'll be the, the, the owners of the property. Uh, and you'll notice there's, it's, it's a little bit hard to see here, but there's actually a D on uh, some of the people, or DA, which means Don y Doña. And at that time, that meant you were a property owner, that you had some kind of social standing, so you probably have more documentation. It's also more increases the likelihood that you were also a slave owner. The columns on the top, uh, the two smaller boxes that I have highlighted on the right are actually tell you how many people were working for the landowner. You have the name of the, the, name of the um, plantation owner, you have the name of the property, the size of the property, how much property has been worked as um, pasture and crops. And then you come the two, two on, the right, on the right, I'm sorry, th that actually tell you what who is working there. You don't have the names, but that you can cross reference with other documentation. So you have like at least one, or, it's very small slave ownership here. You only have, uh, someone only has one or three, yet the number of what they literally call peons, peones, are listed on the column next to it. So um, it's really useful if you're trying to figure out relationships. Uh, there's really high endogamy in Puerto Rico, which is high cousin marriages. So one of, the, one of the things that's helpful is seeing the proximity of some of the people that are living next to each other. And I think a lot, you know, everybody here, if you work with records from another place, it's, it's, it's something that you look for in terms of um, the community. So um, this is like before they have two more uh, larger censuses in the 1860s and 1870s. So this is, this is actually marking a transformation from like a military economy to a plantation economy that then really takes off in the mid 19th century. So it's useful as economic information, it's useful as community information, it's useful for starting to, if you, it also if you know that you had an ancestor who worked or who was enslaved by one of these people and a lot of people did keep the surname uh, at that time, it's possible to track, to work backwards that way. So in tandem with a lot of other documents, this, this, is, this is really useful. It's at the Archivo General de Puerto Rico. These things were microfilmed both by NARA and the LDS um, uh, in the mid 80s. But exactly where it is in the uh, Family Search archives, I'm not sure because recently they uh, renewed their uh, permissions with the Puerto Rican government. So now you have some films that are you have permission to view it from home and others that you don't. And then you have the films were renumbered. So, uh, and a lot of these films are not indexed. So right now I'm not sure what the exact placement of it is, but I found this very useful because I do find transcriptions of parts of this in books that didn't list everybody who was on there. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think. So, so then they're notarial documents, and those would be equivalent to the court documents that would list any kind of sales of people or property, and those you can cross-reference with these with these kinds of municipal document series. Uh, Ellen, there's a question from the chat room about would this type of uh, record been found in other Spanish colonies like Cuba or the Dominican Republic? Probably, but I'm not. I'm not exactly sure because I I haven't really seen a lot of Cuban archives online either, and uh, and I I understand that there's a big effort to improve archival access, but I haven't seen a lot uh, like that. But I I would think there would be a version of this depending on the scale of the island. Okay. Anything else to add? Well, don't be intimidated by it. something that's called Gobernos Españoles because it's it's a humongous collection of documents from Puerto Rico. And underneath that rubric, you'll find many, many things that cover that it it, it covers several centuries of of information. So um, there's there's tremendous amount of cross referencing that you can do with this. All right. 
And we're gonna move to the next document. This one is mine. <laughs> we're gonna skip over James and hopefully come back to him. Um, so yeah, this is interesting. So let me give a little bit of a, of a overarching uh, explanation of this. Mm -hmm. So for uh, the next document, which is a chancery court case, I was going through uh, this chancery court case. Uh, it was the executors of an estate were suing, uh, you know, some people who were part of the estate. It was uh, basically the executors versus one of uh, daughters and her husband, who they claim basically extorted the deceased person um, in, in, into signing over all their land and property and possessions, um, and so that those things would not be divided evenly amongst their other surviving children and their families. And so this file was about 70 pages, you know, big. Um, and I found it on the Library of Virginia website. Uh, believe it or not, free. It was free 99. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So this is chance record. This is, you know, this is a civil suit that's being executed between two parties. Um, and um, I was thinking after it because I discovered through my, my maternal grandfather that because of a high amount of endogamy or intermarriage between um, my Chisholms and my Wallings, I had DNA uh, that was preserved from my sixth and seventh great grandparents. And I was trying to legitimize whether or not my seventh great grandparent was actually who it was supposed to be because I descended from him through one of his daughters, which anyone who does his research knows that that is actually rough to do because women are not always named in documents going back this far. We're talking, you know, 1700s at this point. And so going through the file um, that I found, this was the executors of my seventh great grandfather um, who sued one of one of their one of his daughters I discovered this drawing and one of the things that they were doing in this case is they were trying to prove whether or not Nicholas Gillington was competent enough to be able to sign away his property you know without being coerced into doing this and towards the back of the file literally this file is like 70 80 pages a page like 69 or page 79 there's a drawing in the file and I was like wait a minute why on earth would they put a drawing in a chance record case file. Well, the reason why they did this was because Nicholas Gillington drew this picture and said how old he was. It says Nicholas Gillington, his hand in the 97th year of his age, which meant that he drew the he drew this picture just doodling, "Hey, I'm 97 years old," and they provided it as proof of his competency. And this court case was from 1792. He actually died in 1773, but the court case did not take place until 1792. And in this court file, it mentioned his daughter, who was my sixth great grandmother, named Eleanor Chisholm. And so you're probably wondering, it's a picture of a castle, it's a person's writing, but I got key things from this. Number one, how he spelled his name, because it's in his own hand, how old he was, the fact that he was born in 1676, which there is no census for that, unless you've got documents for someone coming over, right? It also mentions, and I don't know whose house this is. The next lead was, whose house is this? I know that he was staying with his daughter at the time, which was my sixth grade grandmother. Was this what her house looked like? They lived in Halifax County, Virginia. Well, this court case took place in Amelia County, Virginia. I know around when he got there, I know who the executives were. They were close friends. There was a bit of a tussle over, over him and his possessions, and he didn't really have very much. But nonetheless, those were my leads to move forward. And the fact that I had not only a guarantee of who my sixth grade grandmother was and her correct name, but also all of her sisters were listed along with their husband's names as well, which then meant that I could start to vet those connections to people because as I mentioned to you, I have DNA from this man, literally have DNA from this man, and it's only because of inner marriage. So my uh, advice to you is go through the entire chance record case files. In fact, look up chance record cases or civil suits um, in your ancestors' names, right? Because in this case, this wasn't Nicholas suing anybody. This was, was his descendants fighting amongst themselves along with the executors. And um, 
vet that and, and use these small things. This is just like Renata's newspaper. This is not something big, gigantic, where it's got slaves names and all sorts of things. But this is something that can prove age and that can prove a connection to stead people. All right, we're going to move forward. James, would you like for me to move back to you? Uh, yes, please. Sorry, okay. I had, I had to go to my front door. <laughs> All right, go ahead and set this up. Okay. Um, well, mine is one of the wordier uh, documents, but I won't. I will spare you uh, a reading of them. Uh, but this is my fourth great grandfather, Joseph McBride. Uh, he was from uh, Troy, uh, which is in Pike County, Alabama, uh, and he died uh, in uh, the beginning of 1919 and did not leave a last will and testament, as this document attests. However, he did. He uh, have 159 acres of land as is outlined, I think, on the fourth or fifth line there, if you look on the left hand side, uh, for, for his farm. Uh, this document, I think, is ve was very important because in reading it, I was able to find out that uh, Granddaddy Joe actually owned or had a uh, life insurance policy through Standard Life Insurance Company of Atlanta, Georgia, for the amount of $2,000. Uh, and then his, and we see where his, uh, Property was estimated to be worth about twenty five hundred dollars, and again, and that's in nineteen nineteen money. Okay, uh, mind you, he was born a slave, so this kind of helps me to understand his social standing uh, and how he grew from being born into slavery, but then going into being a landowner. Right now, something else that's very important about that particular line, and this is again a so what, as Dr. Shelley Murphy would say, you know, the fact that he owned had a life a life insurance policy with Standard Life Insurance Company. Who was that company? Why? What were? What was their history? Why were they important? Why did he use them? One thing that I was able to find out about Standard Life Insurance Company is not only was it one of the um, uh, biggest uh, insurance companies for blacks during the early 20th century, but it actually started out as a uh, program of the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows, a black fraternal organization. Now, I, uh, if anybody follows me you, or has heard me talk about Granddaddy Joe, you would know that he was the first uh, Prince Hall Freemason in my particular family line that I've tracked. So I cannot document right now him being a member of the Odd Fellows, but I know that he was a Mason. And could he have been an Odd Fellow? Yeah, you help it helps you to build a profile and know where else to look. Okay, um, as you go forward through this document, you'll see where it lists out uh, his children. You see Eva, or um, you see Alberta. Uh, McBride, and if you notice over Alberta, who was my third great grandmother, uh, it said Alberta McBride, and somebody put the name Townsend over it. The reason why they did that was because her husband was Toby Townsend, and T Townsend was her married name. And you'll see that again, I think, uh, right there next to her with her sister, uh, Cole. You'll see it's, it kind of said McBride, but then they put Carter over there. Okay, um, researching women is something I think that uh, we often overlook. Um, I think, uh, and Nika, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think that may be on that on that poll for a subject possibly for next season. Um, it is wonderful, wonderful. Um, one of the biggest problems that we have in names for men is oftentimes you will find initials for men, but then when you look for women, another, uh, one big problem you have is trying to find those maiden names, and sometimes we find women identified as Mrs. James Morgan, but not. Giving her her identity and her agency. So to her, to her name is Christy. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> uh, to be able to find uh, that information is very key because you know at the time I did not necessarily know. I knew Grandma Alberta, but I didn't know that her sister had become a Carter. So now I know I have some Carter relatives that I needed to go uh, check out. Uh, one of the last things that I'll say about this particular document, which was very important to me was that it actually also verified, uh, oral history that I had been told from my grandfather. Uh, the oral history I had been told was that granddaddy Joe died and his wife, Jane, he and his wife, Jane died within like two weeks of each other, leaving their two oldest ch children, uh, Aunt Eva and grandma Alberta to r help raise their younger siblings. This was an oral story that I had heard, but did not have documentation for it. Well, if you look at this document, you will see clearly delineated the the children who were over the age of 21 and those who were under the age of 21. So this helps to verify uh, a, a piece of oral history that had been passed down uh, to me uh, from my grandfather. So even though we know oral history is good and, it, and it's very important, having that backup documentation 
really helps to set it up. Uh, last thing I'll say on it, and then we'll move on. I don't, I don't know if anybody's asking a question, but to go back to that um, standard life insurance uh, policy real quickly, one thing that I learned was that uh, in a lot of the local black newspapers, they would often note when somebody filed an insurance claim, at least in Alabama, I, I found this to be common. They, it, they, they would note when someone uh, had an insurance claim out for a recently deceased relative, they would note if that family got paid or if they did not get paid, if, no, if an agent showed up or not. And I was able to find that document um, in an Alabama newspaper as well. I didn't share it here, but, uh, but, but I was able to find that as well. All right, moving forward, next document. Now you're probably thinking birth certificate. Hmm, I mean, goodness, we can find this in a lot of different places. Some of them have been declassified and are available online in the various search sites. Some of them um, you can actually write to the state to get access to them, depending on your relationship with the person. You know, you could be a next of kin, you could be a legal uh, representative of that person. Um, you can find these in a number of different places. Of course, this document was created, of course, to verify the birth birth of said person. But we have to remember that birth certificates are really 20th century inventions for the most part. They were really only consistently created really after uh, the 1920s. And for the most part, most people only really needed them to apply for social security benefits. In this case, this is my grandmother's birth certificate. And if you notice at the top, it doesn't say birth certificate. It says delayed birth certificate or delayed certificate of birth. And I saw after this document, of course, because I wanted to prove my grandmother's age, right? We wanted to prove that. Um, and I found it because, well, she left it to me. That's how I found it. It was actually a certified copy of her delayed birth record issued by the state of Oklahoma. Key facts on it, of course, are where she was born, um, the county. Um, and I'll, one of the things that stood out to me is the fact that her race was not filled out. And I believe that that was deliberate. We identify as African-American, but this particular branch of my family are Cherokee freedmen. And I believe that my grandmother left her race off in the, in the potential uh, instance that maybe she was going to apply for something for tribal benefits and she didn't want to be discriminated against based off the fact that she wrote black. So she left it blank. And that was probably done at my Uncle Wilbert's uh, insistence. Who <laughs> He also, uh, Uncle Wilbert actually served, uh, he gave an affidavit of personal knowledge because all they had at this point, they, did, they didn't have the midwife go and report her birth. She was born in 1919. Um, they had to use a few different sources of information. You can see that with the big gigantic circle. One is an affidavit of personal knowledge from Wilbert Rogers. And if I didn't know that that was Uncle Wilbert, I would then be vetting who is Wilbert Rogers and where is this affidavit of personal knowledge issued on June 2nd, 1977? If you notice, she's born in 1919, but the affidavit was not done until 1977. There's also an application for a social security and it's got the number there. So that can be applied for as well. There's a family Bible. Who in the world has it? I don't know. I have to search that out. That's probably the people in Kansas City. The other thing I noticed is that she didn't apply for this or she didn't, this wasn't signed by a notary until June 30th, 1977. So that's a long time between when she was actually born and when the certificate was actually created. Now, the thing at the bottom, is, which I find interesting and is of genealogical use to us, is right underneath uh, the big circle, it says information concerning registrant as stated in record. And it gives basically a verification account of what was said on each of the documents based on the number. And it gives the information in terms of parents' names um, and the actual date. And so it's almost like a genealogical proof standard right there on the <laughs> birth certificate. And so where I was able to process research-wise, well, I could verify my grandmother's birthday, I could ver verify her birth location, could verify her race because she did not list it, um, but I was able to move forward in terms of being able to solidify where she lived at the time. Remember, this is 1977. If you look at the address, it says she lived in Gardena, California. That's so far away from Oklahoma. Why was she in Gardena? Well, my grandparents had just moved to California. I remember the house on Kashmir. So when you're looking at birth certificates in particular, look at the top, make sure it's not delayed. If it's delayed, ask why. If you have access to delayed birth certificates, get them because you can get additional information. Seek out the affidavits, the application for social security and the Bible record. Those are three separate sources of information that I could seek out outside of this birth certificate that I, if I was just stopped at her birth date, I would not have access to those things. 
Moving forward, next document, Bernice Alexander Bennett. Unmute yourself, Bernice. Okay, this is, as you all can see, this is a marriage license and a matrimonial bond. Um, I was seeking this uh, record because I was trying to develop a timeline for my ancestor, Peter Clark. And as you can see, it's from the parish of St. Helena, which is located in Louisiana. Now, this is an original, a copy of an original document because I went to the courthouse and I went through every single marriage license. So there's basic information on this record. First of all, I wanna tell everyone, read every single line of a marriage record. Most people will look for the bride's name, the groom's name, I mean, as far as facts and the date. This particular date was in 1881, but it also gives the name of the elder who was authorized to solemnize this, this wedding. And so we now have the name of the, of the preacher. We also have the name of the people who were the witnesses. Now I'm really big into looking at who's in the community. And one of the things I immediately noticed was that the, the, the elder was Elder R. Wilson, the person who could conduct the, the marriage. There's also a Samuel Wilson of which I'm thinking, okay, they could be related. But in addition to this, this is a bond, a marriage bond. So what you will find in a marriage bond will be money. And so someone had to put up this $500 bond so that when they went to the courthouse and everything was in order and they got married, they had this person there. And his name was William L. Tillery. Now, one of the things that I discovered about William L. Tillery was that he was a merchant in that community. But my great-great-grandfather, Peter Clark, when he got married in 1874, there was also a marriage bond for him. And the person who put up the marriage bond was named William H. Tillery. So what you start doing with these marriage license and bonds is you start trying to figure out the various connections. How is William L. connected to William H.? How is Samuel Wilson collect, connected to Elder Wilson? How is Peter Clark connected to Samuel Wilson? How is Felix Overton connected? So that's what this is all about. It's pulling together all of these relationships so that you then have a big story about this community group. Uh, also, I want you to, to know that the maiden name of the bride is listed. And that's important because I think James mentioned sometimes it's really hard to find the maiden name. Well, here it is, Amy Hayes. Felix Overton married Amy Hayes. So as you continue to search for this family group, you start finding Felix and Amy. We're tracking them all the way through. 1910, 1920, they're there. So that's what I want to say about the marriage record, the marriage bond. It provided me with just wonderful information. And one of the things I want to say over and over again, continue to read every piece of information. Look at who's signing. Look at how they're signing. If they're putting an X or if you see the word his mark, it may have something to do with literacy and it may not. But look at everything that's in the marriage record. All right. Next up is Teresa. Can you hear me now? Um, yes. What you're looking at is a family Bible from uh, Mrs. William Luke's. I'm not too sure which one, because there were two. Uh, this was taken from the 
was found at the New Jersey Historical Society in the O'Fake Lynch file. Uh, we are descendants, well, the O'Fake patriarch, John O'Fake, was, uh, his mother's line was originally on Thompson. So I was, I just went and looked at their collection and came across this gold mine. Um, the names of the people listed here, some are misspelled. Some of the death dates are a year or two years off. However, it is a gold mine. Uh, because I've done a lot of research on this line, um, and it's a perfect example of what I want to call early African-American endogamy. Um, and in researching my family line, uh, you'll see certain names like we have Degrassi, we have Hayden. Um, the Degrassi line uh, intermarried with our Van Saley's. And I believe at the top of the uh, left-hand side, you'll see uh, Van Saley's. Uh, they were one of the original Afro-Dutch Native American families that moved from uh, New Amsterdam over to the Tappan Patent. Uh, these names are a gold mine uh, because if you look at Daniel Hayden, uh, we're also direct descendants of the Hayden family from Scarsdale. Um, the, they're all collateral family names. So all these surnames are actually our family names. And what is fantastic is the Degrassis, uh, the Haydens are all well-known black abolitionist families. So when I saw these names, I can easily go back. Um, John Van Saley was known as the Turk. Uh, his wife, Margaret, they had five children. One of their daughters married uh, our Daniel Hayden line. Um, Margaret, their daughter, ended up having five kids. One of those daughters married uh, George de Grassi. Another daughter, Margaret, married William Lukes. Um, you have Peter Vogel saying at the very end, he turned around and actually married two sisters. One, Theodora, died, and his other wife was her sister. Um, you have Reverend Isaiah Degrassi, who became a missionary not only in West Africa, but in Jamaica, early abolitionist. He also attended the African Free School. Um, both um, Dr. John Degrassi and Peter Vogelsang were members of the 54th Regiment, Glory. Um, and I've been looking at not only our family, but our family and how it ties to Carla Peterson's family. Uh, she wrote Back Gotham, uh, Black Gotham, and we're, we're that close to making a connection, but if you read her book and other books, um, other published genealogies, the New York Biographical and Genealogical um, Society actually had a two-part series on uh, uh, the, the Van Saley line and where you saw all the same names. So I've been able to verify, cross-check with published genealogies, um, published books. Um, within this folder, there was also a, a memorial book, which, it, which again had the correct spellings of the name. So don't let misspellings stop your groove. Always verify, keep going back and verifying, and dig deep. So, you know, I'm able to verify from newspaper articles for generations looking at how this original um, New York City, New Jersey uh, uh, family, extended family, maintained their ties and actually intermarried often over generations. So I've been able to trace from the late 1700s until after the Civil War uh, with these families. So I just want to say, dig deep, don't stop digging, don't let misspellings get you, they're always going to be misspellings. I can't even tell you how many uh, ways things are spelled. Next. <laughs> All right, True, you're up next. All righty. So this form right here, this document is what we call a DD-214. It's an official document that's issued by the Army. And this is Daddy's. And it's a primary um, administration record. It's your final uh, paperwork for retirement and separation from the armed forces. So I know you see these four marks here because we're verifying um, uh, Daddy's uh, military service along with other things that he has. So it's kind of like a, a verification and you know, 
an answer to other things that we've already collected on him. Where as like his unit, like that's something that we knew from oral history. So we knew that daddy was a colored troop with the 470th. And that coincides with photos that he has. Um, his address, which was Route 1, Box 152, we know where that's at in Midway. That's Grandma Eddie's um, property there. And some things that daddy did say in his oral history, he was saying that he was from, uh, he served in Normandy on the second day. And I was shocked when I saw this and his MOS, which this is military occupational specialty, which he was an amphibious truck um, driver. So he had his own duck uh, during Normandy in World War II. And I think that other line, I can't remember what that was, but that was his time of service and then his pay data. And I'll explain about that pay data line there um, because from that, I got another record. So this is a characterization of um, daddy service. Um, you have to treat this document like it's your birth certificate, your marriage license, and your social security card. There's a long short a uh, long version and a short version. And this is what it looked like prior to 1950, um, because after that, um, I'll explain that too, about how why those documents were um, looking different from the other wars till after 1950. But this includes his nature of service, his dates, awards, decorations, important details that's going to follow you for the rest of your life. So that's why this document is pertinent when you find it. Or if you don't have it, I'll tell you about that later on. Um, this was created from um, the Department of Defense um, for all five branches of the military because it was to try to consolidate and compile all their pertinent information in one place. Because before you'd have this big chug a lug book and they just wanted it all on, you know, to be ready, um, available for you and access for the, you know, all the verification with this document because you have to use it for other things later on um, in life. So when I was seeking out this, it was mainly about, like I said earlier, about verification and confirmation and timeline building um, on daddy's life. And this is always going to be part of a person's 201 file or what you all call the official military personnel uh, file of a person. Um, so what was my other thing about this? What I wanted to explain about what you can learn from this experience of analyzing this document line by line, because you see already how detailed it is. Um, if you don't have this 214, which I hear uh, people saying, they, well, I don't know if my parent has this or a or an ancestor, or it got lost. What am I? What are, what are my next steps? Um, if I didn't have daddy's because he kept a very detailed um, record of all his military workers, which I do now. My file is about this big from my years of service. Um, but what you can do is this is a good primary source, an uh, alternate that leads you to like about 19 million pay, voucher, pay vouchers that are available. And that was another thing that I got from daddy that you can get from there because this is where I got this at. Um, and then you can also get it from the Department of Archives and History, which is where I really exactly got it. But you, most people go through narrow. But you want to make sure you check those archives and libraries and, and such because those these documents are there. But it can help you rebuild a person's military um you know, reconstruct their file. Um, and that means that if you have like training certificates or evaluations or travel orders, you can start taking those documents and the NARA can help you start rebuilding this actual DD-214. So basically that's what I wanted you to get out of a regular DD-214. Don't give up hope because there are ways to rebuild this and to go get this done again if it's been lost or you can't find it or if you don't know or if you just have that one document how can I get my service members file rebuilt into this document right here so I don't know if there's any questions several people in the chat room are asking about how to get DD214s Drew did you want to cover that or did you want me to do it 
Um, you can answer it. I, I know that NARA does a lot of the work, but I went to the archives to actually just go and get this copy, but daddy had his, and then, um, you can go to the courthouse. Like I have mine in two different States. So a lot of times these soldiers took their record up there. So it wouldn't be of loss, you know, for fire or you're moving around so much like we did, we would make sure that I had it up at the courthouse. So in case I needed to get a copy of it. And also I wanted to mention to this book right here, I know you all can't see this, but this came out of a library um, in 1996 that was written by the tourism council. And in the back of the book, they had daddy's name and every soldier in the County, whether they were black or white and daily instances. So even if I didn't know about all of this, I could have found daddy in this book here and then took what was in here up to a NARA or court, uh, the, the archives and get daddy's actual copy. So there's ways around, you know, getting that 214. Yeah. I was going to also suggest to everyone, um, to write to the national personnel record center, mm -hmm. um, that's located in, uh, St. Louis, Thank Missouri. You. Um, mm -hmm. As long as you have uh, some people are talking, they have folks they want to get this for that, um, you know, that are, you know, they have power of attorney for you can write the National Personnel Records Center and get a copy of their service file and their DD-214. Now, mm -hmm. that does come with a caveat. Some of the records were destroyed in a fire. And that's the reason why True is mentioning going yes. through National Archives to kind of re recapture the information that would have been in a military service file if you do get one of those rejection notices or where they say that the file has been destroyed. It's certain alpha letters that were destroyed um, when you when you uh, reach out to the National Personnel Neck, uh, Record Center. And people are saying which National Archives. Um, it, really, if you Google it, it will uh, it will bring up the, the main website. Gov. Yeah, yeah uh, archives.gov. Yeah, it's got there's a whole military section and there's full instructions on how to get this. But do remember, as I mentioned, that mm -hmm. a lot of records were damaged. And this is the reason why she's suggesting for you to try to, you know, once you find out the regiment, the, you know, the service that took place, um, you know, using additional records from the National Archives to rebuild this DD-214 or military records themselves. Um, a great place to start for this is is at the county level, which she mentioned. She's mm -hmm. her discharge stuff is in two different counties. Go to the county level where your ancestor uh, would have had this officially recorded. And that's a great um, that's a great resource as well. Anything else you want to add before we get to the last couple documents? I think I'm good to go. I just don't want people to give up hope if they say they can't find it because there is a way to rebuild it. And that's what I want you to take away from that, even though I have a lot of stuff and you may have one, but there's people out there that don't. So. All right. Well, we're going to, I'm going to hit two of these really super quick and you're probably wondering city directory. This is just like a, uh, you know, a delayed birth certificate. This is something that we probably look at more often than not, right? This is city directory. This is pre-telephones. This is when you had to go up through the street and they told you to go see Mr. Atlas and his wife, Bessie, and you didn't know where in the world they live. And you lived in Shreveport, or maybe you were going to visit Shreveport, Louisiana. This is how you would find them is in the city directory. And eventually as people got phones, they would then of course have the phone. And then this became the phone book. This was created, as I mentioned, to locate people. I sought after this document because there was family oral history on this particular line about, um, you know, the, and I hate saying this, the tried and true, we got ran out of town by white people story. That applied to uh, this particular branch of my family where there was an accusation made that people were run out of town by white people. I don't know why that is just always a story, but that's what happened. And I was trying to verify when that particular incident allegedly took place. And so uh, this year of this particular um, uh, directory is 1941, Shreveport, Louisiana, Cato Parish, Louisiana. That's where this is located. Um, and I found this on Ancestry. Um, there are a ton of uh, city directories online um, through Ancestry, but don't don't just think that these are online. If you go locally, in fact, I found way more city directories at the Shreveport Library in Louisiana that where I was actually able to basically go year by year um, looking for these particular people in my family. You're probably wondering, why was I chasing city directories? Well, those are capturing people in the household at that time. If you look at this documentation or this notation, it says uh, William S. Atlas. It has a C, which, mo which means that he is colored or black. 
and mentions Bessie, who is his wife, and that's in the parentheses, and in list two, that's the number of people in his household. He had 13 children. So at this point, it was only him, his wife, and two children. That's it. Where were the other children? <laughs> there were a number of boys who were under the age of 18. Hmm. So if I looked at this, I looked at this in 1941, the majority of the kids are gone, right? Says he's a laborer. He lives in the rear of 2201 Marion Street. Um, and that's in Shreveport. In fact, that actually doesn't exist anymore. I think a highway runs through that. But when I looked at a previous um, census or actually a previous city directory, it listed about seven more people in the household than this. And that was for the year 1939. So I knew whatever trauma took place had to have happened between those two years. Or there was a huge mass exodus in this particular family because going from one directory to the next year by year, 39 to 41, there is a huge loss of people in one household. So this could be, this is, this is one way to use a city directory outside of the obvious, which is verifying that a person is still alive. Or in some instances, you'll see maybe if William had died, it would say Bessie Atlas, widow of William. That would give you a ballpark figure as to when William would have died. You can kind of, you know, put a start and an end date to that. Um, but this this provides me with more information to move forward. Who were those children in the household? Well, of course, naturally, you're going to look at the 1940 census to see who's in the household. There were only two children in the household in 1940. So that verified this particular information. So that's just a, this is just quick this is a quick one, but this is this is a way that you can capture household numbers. Um, you know, especially um, when you when it's in between census years. Um, and oh, there's a comment in our uh, chat room that they don't always see a number like that in other listings. Particular, it depends on who produced the city directory. Some of them did do this. Some of them did not. I know that I've seen this, uh, particularly in this particular area, um, in the northern Louisiana, um, and actually sort of southern, southeastern Arkansas area, I've seen the number of people in a household. Another quick tip for this is make sure you know what the definitions for the symbols and things are in a city directory, but when you go and pull, pull one up. The reason why you won't know that that C meant colored, unless you go to the front, sometimes they'll use a copyright signal, uh, symbol in that stead. Um, and also how to read through the, uh, through the data that's there. All right, last document. Of course, death certificates, right? This is giving us key information. We love them because, of course, they tell us when a person died. But information on them could be key. Have you ever overlooked the cemetery? Have you seen a, a series of, of death certificates for a particular family where the same cemetery is being listed? Have you sought out that particular cemetery. Of course, you're getting this because you want to know when the person died. You want additional details such as their parents, you know, names, lo birth locations, who the informant was, right? We've been telling you the entire time tonight to search out those witnesses and informants. So here's yet another, <laughs> another reminder to search out those people. Who was Lemon Pharaoh in connection with Charity Pharaoh? Why would I seek out this certificate? Well, these pharaohs are related to me. Ironically, this is so funny. I have a family family name of King, and then there's someone who's connected to me through DNA with the last name Pharaoh. I don't know what it is with everybody in uh, <laughs> and <laughs> Egypt, but uh, Lemon Pharaoh is this is the <laughs> the informant, and he happens to be Charity Pharaoh. All these nouns and the last name Pharaoh uh, that happens to be her husband, and. Um, he was the informant on, on the death certificate, which, of course, they're listing his address as Cottondale, Florida. It lists her birthplace as two different places. One is Escambia County, Florida, and the other is Washington County. They're neighboring, but they're not the same county. That's a potential lead to look up Bill Gaynor, who was listed as Charity's father, and Celie Gaynor, who was listed as her mother. Also, another lead in this particular document, if you're breaking it down outside of the obvious, which would be a cause of death, maybe if you're tracking medical history in your family, um, would be a, a, a potentially even um, who signed it in terms of the medical professional and whether or not that professional administered care to other people in your family. Maybe they have records that are available. Maybe their office is still out there. But also the undertaker. Um, it's a little hard to see because our, uh, you know, our folks are there. Um, but, uh, 
who's James Wilson? And and seems like we've got a lot of Wilsons tonight. And what does he have to do with this particular family? Was that the, you know, the this tried and true uh, undertaker that the entire family used? You can potentially look at records there that can maybe hold more information than what's on this death certificate, because of course they only had so many fields that they could fill up. Um, they couldn't capture everything. So the, the mortuary might have more. Um, so this is yet another lead. Um, and I'm laughing at the chat room. Someone asked about if I was related to comedian Jay Farrell. And that's the first person that I thought of when I saw this death, when I saw this family that I was connected to with the last name Farrell. I was like, am I related to Jay Farrell? <laughs> Perhaps. Oh, I'm so glad y'all couldn't hear my giggles. <laughs> I know, but Charity Farrell, Lemon Farrell, um, Escambia and Washington counties do connect. Um, so, and they're close to Alabama, which is where Lemon Farrell came from. Um, and that's uh, my DNA lead. And so that's why I was chasing down his wife, because as you know, DNA is not always about the direct lines. It, you could be from, addition, from another line from a particular family. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so that's just it. We got time. We need to get to ask Mariah. We've got a lot of questions. Let's see in the chat room. Witness to the death. But okay, let's see. Goodness gracious. People are taking a lot of notes in the chat. I don't know if you all know that. <laughs> but they are mm -hmm. uh, they're taking scary. a lot of notes in the chat. I know. And we've got a lot, we've got a lot of uh, uh, stuff to get to, including Ask yeah. Mariah. Someone mentioned in the chat room, Jay Farrow's from Chicago. Well, this branch of my family, both sides of my family are from Chicago. So that doesn't really help me. <laughs> and the fact that Pharaoh is butchered. F A R O F E R O P H E R O P H A R O. Yeah, it's just those commercials. Yeah. I know. I know. It's just, it's a time in the land. All right, moving forward, we've got to ask Mariah. And it's your favorite time of the show. And this is the part where you, the viewer, submit your questions, queries, conundrums, and more to the panel. And we weigh in live with research help specifically geared towards you. The panelists never see the queries beforehand, so you get a chance to see us work together live to help our genie buds get past their brick walls. Tonight's query is from, ironically, a cousin of mine. I bet you Shelly didn't know this. Uh, <laughs> Stephanie Simmons Johnson. Here is her ass, Mariah. My third great grandfather, Samuel Wilson, was born in Virginia, where we are on Virginia tonight. Goodness gracious. Um, 1829, shipped to Louisiana in 1847. I found him listed on the, quote, shipping manifest to New Orleans, shipped from Richmond, Virginia. How can I begin my research in Virginia to find his enslaved holder. So she's got a great, great, great grandfather, Samuel Wilson, born in Virginia in 1829. She has what she believes is a ship manifest going from Richmond, Virginia to New Orleans. Um, and that he was shipped in 1847. And she wants to know how she can begin her research to find his enslaved holder. Next slide. No one else is tracing this lineage, and she has taken DNA tests on Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, um, and I've seen her there because that's how I know she's my cousin. <laughs> so the question is, if you've got a ship manifest and you're pretty sure you have the right person, how do you find the slaveholder? How do you do it? One thing I would suggest right off the bat, having recently worked in these records, is look in the Freedman, uh, Freedman's Bank records in New Orleans. I looked in those two, I was investigating sort of the Richmond to New Orleans pipeline, writing an article about it. And you, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, it, it, most of the people that you see in the New Orleans Freed, Freedman's Bank records um, we're born in Virginia, we're born in North Carolina, we're born in South Carolina. But on that, because they asked so many detailed questions, I was able to see who the family members were and whether they were left behind or they were somewhere else. I would go straight to, if it were me, Friedman's bank records for New Orleans and see what you find there. I would recommend that they also go to the newspaper. My ancestor was also on a, sh a slave ship manifest from Richmond to New Orleans. I wanted to find out about the ship and I went to the newspaper to find out about the ship and just a whole lot of information came up. Also, you have the notorial archives 
in Louisiana, of which I mean, all documents have to be notarized. So that might be a way that you start finding out who the slave owner was, uh, who was the seller and who was the buyer. And it had to be a notarized document. So I would certainly recommend that they explore the notarial archives as well as the newspaper. And, and I have a thought when you guys are talking. Number one, a couple years ago, there was a symposium from New Orleans and the Library of Virginia, and it was recorded so people can go back. And that's what they're talking about is this transportation and the ships going out of Virginia to Louisiana. And they talked about records and what books and things like that. So they can Google that. And also um, Maury McGinnis, uh, was on that panel. So you can link her name. And I think Bernice, you remember that. And it was live and recorded. The first half in the morning was Virginia. Second half was Louisiana. The other thing I would think about is the communities in Louisiana. And I'm not a heavy researcher in Louisiana, but looking for, looking the census for people born in Virginia you know, if you're looking at a specific census, whatever year it is, 1860, and see if in the neighborhood or where your person might have been or was, see how many other people were also born in Virginia and start looking and glancing at the community to see if this is a group that came. Nine times out of 10, if they're sold from Virginia to Louisiana, they might stay a little bit in somewhere in Louisiana together as far as going to another plantation. So that's another thought. Right. Also, in addition to that, the slave uh, ship manifest, manifest, look at all of the names on the manifest. If you start going back in those pages, you may find other kin folks because most of them had first and last names. Yeah. Of course, they had the age. They had the, sometimes a description of the person. So I would definitely recommend not just looking at your ancestor on that particular manifest, but look at all of the people on the manifest and see if maybe you could track them. You may be tracking your, your family, a larger part of your family. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I was. I want to know, because she, she didn't say this, did she vet the shipper and the receiver on the, in, on the manifest? Um, because sometimes if you do that, you can see if this is a major trader and they were bringing a, a lot of slaves from uh, Virginia and to sell them off. Um, and then that would then, um, you know, going through the notorial archives, then you would search for that particular name to see who that particular shipper sold, you know, or sold them to within Louisiana. And then of course, then they would have to take them to where uh, the family's from, which is Point Coupee. If this is the same line, I'm pretty sure <laughs> it's going to Point Coupee uh, Parish, Louisiana. Um, Karen Royal also brings up uh, Cash for Blood, which can be helpful. Um, I do have that book somewhere because I just got it on Amazon. Um, great resource, especially if you're researching uh, the DMV area or Baltimore mm -hmm. in particular, talking about um, the major players in the domestic slave trade from Baltimore to New Orleans. Um, this is available, like I said, on Amazon. Great book, great resource. Um, FYI, if you're trying to find um, and transactions, uh, deeds, you know, selling slaves, they do not exist for the city of Baltimore. Or they do, but it's very, very scant compared to what they were. They were destroyed. Um, I reached out to the the uh, Noreen who comes to Maggie and I asked because she volunteers there. I asked her um, if they could find deeds and she told she spoke to the major archivists and they the majority of them are destroyed. The ones that are preserved are actually in this book. In the book. Um, wow. Yeah. So and, that's just and a, this that's is a this is a good time for Google your friend. And because you never know who's either blogged about the same thing or the same topic. So I think it might be a shot in the dark, but you never know what might show up on Google and then verify it. But you know, you're talking about these ships and look what just came out on Zora's last book. Remember 
you had uh, Quest Love, and then you know all this stuff coming about Cujo Lewis and things like that. Angela did a blog on him, and being the last one coming in, and a lot of people only found out about that because of the show and and Quest Love and getting excited about finding that information and start googling. So we got some great opportunities to start researching. And also if there's any um, oral history things that might've came down that might just stick out about something. So I thought that was, uh, you know, another thing that folks could do. And is it um, John Hope Franklin's The Big Book that they'd like to see uh, as the textbook for school? Uh, Nico, do you remember the name of it? I you have about it. The, you talking about the brown one? I think I have it still. I saved it from college. Yeah, no. John Hope Franklin did a, a book called Slavery Something, The History Something of Slavery. Yeah. That one. And um, I would look into that because that was hailed as one of the most thorough ones that had been done pretty much on slavery. And I think that'd be a good resource. Something else that I, I also want to bring attention to her to is has she vetted the owner locally before trying to make this jump to Virginia? Mm. Because I haven't seen, I mean, maybe she's, she'll probably message me later and say, well, I have this, this, and this, but I didn't see where, how does she know that this is her Samuel? Right, right. Don't know. How do we know that that's her Samuel? Yeah. And, you know, and, and is it a matter of yeah. the p other people who are on the manifest that ended up in the community later? Or is it a slave narrative? What is it? How does she know that that's her Samuel? She still has to vet him locally because that's a whole lot of time between 1847 from when she says that he arrived in New Orleans to 1865. That's a lot of time to account mm -hmm. for. He could have gone through different owners, a number of different things. So has she sought him out? Um, at the, at the courthouse level, has she vetted all those leads to the last slaveholder there? And then yeah. that potentially could jump her to New Orleans and then to Richmond. Um, but you've got to work all that local stuff out first because you just have to be sure that you have the right person. Um, and in terms of these manifests, I just want, um, cause people are probably like, really these exist? Yes. So after the importation of slaves was banned in the United States, um, you know, you couldn't import slaves from Africa or elsewhere um, mm -hmm. after 1810. Um, they had to document um, when they were taking slaves from one place to another, if they were on boats. And this is um, the database that she's referring to. And this is actual actual uh, manifest where you see the date, uh, April 1st, 1847. Um, and it mentions um, Abraham, I guess, Lay, something like that, Collector District of Texas. Um, and it mentions the original manifest or list of slaves in this office certified that G. Gates, the shipper um, set of said slaves, and G. Gates or Gordon Gates, the master of the, and it mentions the Brigadier Metamore on this day have made, um, and it mentions, you know, the, the act of the importation of slaves being banned. And then this is just the first page. The next page is where we get to the actual list of people. This one was actually kind of chopped up because of how many folks are on it. And it lists their names and ages. And if you notice on this particular one, you've got last names. Mm. Which can so, trigger you right back to the slaveholder in, in exactly. uh, the East Coast or wherever. Yeah, exactly. So this is under uh, New Orleans, Louisiana Slave Manifest, 1807 to 1860. And remember, this is not all encompassing because if they came by land, they're not going to be on a ship, right? Correct. Correct. I put the link in there. It won't let me put it in the chat. I'll put okay. it over there. Okay. Okay. All right. Hopefully and also we've you one last thing. I'm sorry. It's she okay. To track the Virginia route, not the route, but how many folks, there was a lot. Remember Zan Nelson tracking the 16 slaves? They went to Louisiana, even though I know we're talking about a ship. They need to find out who, who was these big slave owners going back and forth. Not all of them just went one time. You know, that this was their, as a trader, they could make more than one trip and there could be more than one manifest that's out there too. The book is uh, From Slavery to Freedom. That's what it is. Yes. I just remember it's brown because yes. I, still, I still have it 
from my yeah. uh, from my African American history class in college. Um, okay, so True posted the link to the Ship Manifest um, filed in New Orleans. Um, that goes uh, that basically it's also on Ancestry as well. Mm -hmm. um, you can get access to that. Um, now they do have manifest from other locations. I want to say it's Savannah, Georgia is one because I've looked at that one. Um, any other ones you all can think of? Because Tom Tom Reed is you asking heard. in the Beaufort, South Carolina. Beaufort, South Carolina. Okay. Yeah, and South there Carolina. are some from uh, Mobile as well. Mobile, Alabama mm -hmm. as well. So if you uh, have any. And Baltimore. Yeah, Baltimore. Baltimore I was trying to say. Uh, oh, mm -hmm. is it Rhode Island? Weren't they a ship, uh, a big trader in something? Rhode Island? Uh, the, yeah, it was Rhode Island. I'll have to find it. But they, there was some ship. Matter of fact, they went to Louisiana. Hold on, I'm gonna go find it. Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk, Is that another one? Norfolk, yeah. Yeah, but do, but and I just want to be clear. Are look at the port cities. Yes, yeah. yes. Oh, look at the port cities. Mm -hmm. That's Charleston. why I said Rhode Island. Yes, but I'm mm -hmm. asking specifically about ship manifests. Mm -hmm. Charleston. Do they exist? Too. Are they on oh, no, I know Charleston's and yeah. I know Savannah's are, but these yeah. other cities are the ship manifests digitized and are they online? Yes. Uh, Buford's online at um, Ancestry.com. And so is Savannah, because I've looked at that mm -hmm. one too, Savannah, mm -hmm. Georgia, um, which is very close to South Carolina. So don't rule that out if you're doing um, potential South Carolina or any other you know, connections for that. Here's a link I'm sending in here. Kathleen Brandt did on Slave Ship Manifest. Maybe there's something that could help her learn a little bit more or where there might have what you're asking as far as did any of them, um, you know, other ports also have a ship manifest. I see Baltimore, Savannah, right? When they open the link, they're showing a list right there. And uh, there's also sworn statements. So we got Beaufort, South Carolina, Charleston, Mobile, Savannah, uh, that's all I'm seeing on this site, which is the archives. Okay, and there's two um, Ancestry.com collections. One is called U.S. Southeast Coastwise Inward and Outward Slave Manifest. And then the second one is New Orleans, Louisiana Slave Manifest. And you are going to see some overlap in these. Let me look and see where some of the places, well, where some of the people are coming from. Mobile, Savannah. Charleston, Beaufort. Okay. Oh, new one. Slave manifest for the port of Philadelphia from August 1800 to 18, April 1860. It's not been digitized yet. Okay. Record group 36. All right. Well, you got your work cut out for you, Stephanie. Um, and of <laughs> course, I know you're going to be messaging me. <laughs> for uh about this but uh do you have a research brick wall and do you would you like help from black Progen scaling that wall submit your query to, to uh us for our ask mariah segment the link is in the description of each and every episode of black Progen live remember to be specific tell uh and tell us everything you searched so we don't duplicate efforts if you get selected and cross your fingers when you press submit you just may get chosen for one of our upcoming episodes quickly going through our current events we want to give a shout out to the bitter southerner what is it? Well, The Bitter Southerner is for the rest of us. It is about the South that the rest of us know. The one we live in today and the one we hope to create in the future. And The Bitter Southerner is an amazingly designed website. The photography, the writing, everything is kind of off the chain. And it's basically for Southerners who are like, man, forget this lost uh, cause mess. Let's talk about stuff that's cool that we like. Like number one, Georgia has a coast, <laughs> which is a photo essay. And yeah. there's a lot of other things on there, like a new look at the Appalachian food. Um, you know, just, just a different take on the South than we normally see. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we gave um, the Bitter Southerner a shout out on Black Progen. So be sure to check that out. There's a lot of historical stuff on there, all sorts of stuff. 
The city of New Orleans has unveiled a smartphone app tour of sites involved in the slave trade during the 18th and 19th centuries. And we've just been talking about New Orleans, so this is totally apropos, um, including pre-Civil War years during which the city was the nation's largest slave market. The project officially launched on Thursday, that was last week, is officially uh, affiliated with uh, New Orleans tricentennial celebrations, meaning the 300th anniversary. It comes as cities around the country are shining an unblinking light on slavery and racial violence through such projects as a slavery museum outside of New Orleans, an Alabama memorial to vi victims of lynchings, and the preservation of slave cemeteries. In announcing the app at a news conference, African-American Mayor Latoya Cantrell said the New Orleans slave trade marker and app project will, quote, let us honor the lives and dignity of those ancestors who were undoubtedly brought and sold here. The city's tricentennial commission reached out to Aaron Greenwald, then curator of the at the historic New Orleans Commission, and historian Joshua Rothman of the University of Alabama after they wrote an opinion piece in 2016 calling out New Orleans for being behind other cities and recognizing difficult history, Greenwald said. The piece noted that Montgomery and Birmingham, Alabama, Charleston, South Carolina, and Memphis, Tennessee all had historical markers noting slavery, reconstruction, or civil rights troubles. But New Orleans had nothing to indicate that 135,000, let me say that again, 135 thousand people of color had been mm. sold in New Orleans as slaves. So feel free to check the app out. It's actually really cool. I have it on my phone and it goes to the intersections of where pivotal locations were in New Orleans. It shows you what they look like now, along with other renderings from the time period that they existed. So um, we'll have the links for those in the chat room so that you guys can download those on Google Play as well as uh, the App Store. Recent news about some of America's elite universities having ties to slavery has been eye-opening. Tune in to learn about specific institutions, their connections, and how to verify if your ancestors were involved on our next episode, Slavery and Ivy League Universities, airing live on Tuesday, October 23rd, 2018, at 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll be joined by our special guest, my boo, Car Karen Harper-Royal, who is part of the Georgetown 272 project. Did you know there are only four shows left in 2018? That's it, which is crazy. Don't miss a single one. Be sure to head to whoisnikasmith.com as well as my YouTube channel uh, for a downloadable schedule and a set of reminders uh, for upcoming episodes. Don't forget to tune into the archive of the long-running research of the National Archives Beyond hosted by Black Progen Life panelist Bernice Bennett. And she's also got new shows coming up this Thursday, October 18th. The topic is A Mind to Stay with Sydney Nathans, Michael Williams, Teresa Williams, and Angela P. This story researched and written by Sydney Nathans begins in 1844 when North Carolina planter Paul Cameron bought 1,600 acres near Greensboro, Alabama and sent out 114 enslaved people to cultivate cotton and enlarge his fortune. Tune in this Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Also check out the African Roots podcast hosted by Black Progen Life panelist Angela Walton Raji. The latest episode was posted on October 3rd and is entitled Interconnected Chickasaw Freedmen Families. Don't forget to join the conversation now. Participate in the live chat on YouTube to the top right hand of the screen if you're watching on a computer and at the bottom of the YouTube app on your mobile device. Also, weigh in on Twitter by tweeting us at Black Progen or use the hashtag Black Progen. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to True Lewis, who is going to sign us out tonight. Nika. <laughs> oh, my <Shelly>. Lord. <laughs> Shelly, we got to come off. Shelly. <laughs> She's D A R ready. <laughs> no, the conversation earlier about the episode on the death record. Yeah, exactly. so clearly Shelly is going to be wearing her hat promoting for. It. She's promoting the Life After Death episode, which is the episode after this one. So it's early November, but she clearly has got her church lady hat. I have to get my church lady hat game up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready. <laughs> oh my goodness. She said, get it. I couldn't reach it, but mama came in. <laughs> oh my Lord. Cause she was trying to get her hat. Notice it's mama's hat. It ain't her hat. No, it's Lord. mine. Mama don't wear a hat. Oh my goodness. Boy. Oh boy. All right. True. Go ahead and sign us out for the evening. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Nika. <laughs> 
We had a great conversation tonight, and I just want to thank everybody out there in our chat room. And if you're here coming on the replay later on and you're able to watch after the show was live, we just want to thank you and we appreciate you. And I just want to thank the panelists that all were here earlier and uh, Bernice, Ellen, and um, Shelly, and Tony right now. You guys did wonderful. So I just want to thank everybody. And Nika, you did an awesome job tonight. So with that, we're all going to say good night. See you next week. Bye-bye. Be safe in Florida, folks. Black Pro Gen Live. Black Pro Gen Live. Black Pro Gen Live. Black Pro Gen Hello, everybody out there. Black Pro Gen Live. Black Pro Gen Live. The unapologetic black and people of color viewpoint. It's a place where evidence tells the stories.